Thank you all for coming out tonight. It's wonderful to be back in, in Cumberland County and especially in beautiful historic Carlisle. Uh, my wife Karen Magnuson, back there in the rear, Karen, would you just raise your hand? And I drove down this afternoon, a beautiful day, and we came down the old way, Port Royal 75 to 74, so over Tuscarora Mountain and over North Mountain. And I thought, you know, Judge Watts, when he was actually a judge, would make the trek from Carlisle, probably up through Wagoner's Gap, along those very curvy switchbacks and roads. Uh, it, it's amazing the sense of history that suffuses you as you drive that road through beautiful uh, Cumberland County, or Perry County, rather. Uh, it's a thrill to be here also because I'm the first person from Penn State to come before this historical society in 91 years. If you look, if you look at that paper on your right, that was authored by Professor, Professor I. Thornton Osmond, who was Professor of Physics at Penn State. He came to the university in 1879 on faculty, and he presented this paper that you see here on February 28th, 1930, 91 years ago. Was anybody present for that presentation? <laughs> okay, I didn't think so, but I just thought I'd check anyway. So uh, it is great to be here. And as I get started tonight, I want to pay special tribute to the folks who made this evening possible. And you see their names here. Kara Curtis, uh, Kara was my first uh, liaison, I think, with this society three years ago. Uh, Richard Tritt did a fabulous job of generating the photos that I needed when this association was closed. Uh, the society was closed, uh, the archives were closed, and he was able to uh, find the photos I needed, many of which appear in the book. Uh, Tristan Malazzo, right over here, was fantastic to work with. Our events coordinator for the night, Sharon Filipovich, uh, I think. Uh, <laughs> and especially David Pfeiffer, right here. David, raise your hand, please. <laughs> David is the executive director of the uh, Pfeiffer Memorial Arboretum and Nature Preserve in New Cumberland. And he is the owner of this portrait that you see here. Uh, this is a portrait of Frederick Watts, painted by the American portrait artist Bass Otis, circa 1835. This is in David's possession, and I'll show you a photograph a little bit later, along with that of his wife at the time, Henrietta Age, and Henrietta's mother, I think. So, thanks to all of you who made this possible. Let's get started. You're traveling on Route 322 to State College, or from State College to Harrisburg, and you see this sign, Watts Exit. I had always wondered what that was all about. And one day I took the exit, and uh, when I got there, there was no there there. There was no town of Watts, as I expected. Uh, but this is where our story begins. And this sign is about two miles west of Amity Hall and the Clarks Ferry Bridge. And that's important for a couple of reasons. It's where the paternal Watts family emigrated, uh, emigrated to back in uh, 17, the early 1760s. Uh, Frederick Watts, who is the grandfather of our Frederick Watts, bought a large tract of land at the confluence of the Juniata and Susquehanna rivers. And uh, Frederick came from a, a very distinguished line of Grandfathers, anyway, both served as Revolutionary War officers and went on to serve the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and the nation in other capacities as well. And it was on that land, back here, uh, that Frederick's father, David Watts, was born in 1764. And uh, let me see here. There we go. I uh, just want to point out, give you a map of Pennsylvania. You can see uh, uh, where Cumberland County is. Obviously, most of you live here, so you're familiar with that. But uh, the point is, Cumberland County was the second county founded west of the Susquehanna in 1750. Uh, York County was the first, 1749, west of the Susquehanna. And everything to the north and west was Cumberland County at one time. 
everything was carved out county by county as the population moved west. And Perry County was carved out of Cumberland in 1820. And Watts Township, which was actually named for David Watts, was carved out and named in 1850. So let's talk about David for just a second. This is Frederick's father. Uh, he was a member of Dickinson College's first graduating classes, uh, class rather, um, and uh, he was a lawyer and a very good one. <coughs> they say he was arguably one of the finest in Pennsylvania. He had a reputation as being a little bit larger than uh, nature, a force of nature, very powerful. He was violent and overbearing. Uh, he was said to have heaped abuse on his opponents, and he was a spendthrift. Money came in, money went out very quickly. Uh, Frederick, his son, is going to be extremely smart, as was his father, but he's going to be the, his polar uh, opposite in temperament. There's a story that I love about David Watts. He was fiercely patriotic. He was a Federalist. And apparently during the Whiskey Rebellion, and you all know the story uh, that involves Carlisle so intimately, um, George Washington came here to federalize the Pennsylvania and New Jersey militia and send them on their way to scare the bejeebers out of the uh, farmers of western Pennsylvania, and it worked. But during the Whiskey Rebellion, some of the Scots-Irish folks hereabout erected a so-called Liberty Pole, and I'm guessing it was uh, in the town square area at the corner of Hanover and High, and they dared anybody to cut it down. They said they would shoot that person. Well, David Watts came in with his ax, like George Washington and the cherry tree, and he cut it down, and uh, nothing happened. No harm befell him. So uh, uh, if you were going to take on David Watts, you needed to be very careful about it. Well, David uh, works as an attorney, very reputable, but he dies in 1819, and uh, Frederick enters Dickinson in 1815, but he, does not, he, he, he never graduates only because Dickinson closes down for a period of time. So David, his father, dies in 1819, and Frederick leaves Carlisle for Erie, and he's going to read law with his uncle. William Miles, who's also a prominent attorney, farmer, developer, Miller, you know, men of that era were jacks of all trade and masters of most of them, actually. Now, at the Miles' farm, Frederick's there for two years, uh, unexpectedly, he falls in love with farming and agriculture, and it's going to become his greatest interest in life. So Frederick returns here to Carlisle in 1821 to practice law. Uh, he builds up a pretty large and lucrative practice very quickly. Uh, he becomes a reporter for the Pennsylvania Supreme Court for a number of years, and he produces 22 volumes. Uh, basically, uh, what he's doing is writing summaries of Supreme Court cases, and uh, did a very fine job with that, and he's writing by hand. Uh, Watts, politically, is a Whig, an ardent Whig, and without labor in this, this was the party that argued pretty much for a strong federal government. They wanted a strong banking system, they wanted protective tariffs to protect domestic industry, and they were fiercely in favor of internal improvements, meaning roads, canals, railways, to unify and develop the nation, and of course they were in favor of public education. Um, eventually, Frederick is going to go on, and about midlife, in 1849, he's going to be named Judge of the Ninth Judicial District, which is basically Cumberland, Perry, and Juniata Counties. Well, here we are, back to David Pfeiffer. Uh, this photo was taken about a year ago at uh, the Memorial Arboretum, and uh, you can see this portrait in situ, if you will, along with that of his wife, Henrietta Age. Um, this was Frederick's second wife, and he married her when she was 17, and he was about 35, 34, 35. So uh, if you get a chance uh, to go out to the Pfeiffer Memorial Arboretum, I hardly recommend it. It's a beautiful place, and the uh, nature preserve is gorgeous. 
So, Watts is here in Carlisle. He's working as a lawyer. And uh, he does get married to Eliza Cranston in 1827. Three daughters. She dies after five years of marriage. And then he remarries, as uh, men often did when they lost their wives in the 19th century. And six children came out of that marriage. Uh, he erects, this is Frederick, a large bank barn, uh, reputed to be the largest in the state. And you see a photo of it here. Uh, it's still there. It's still in operation. This is a barn that's pretty close to 200 years of age. Uh, it's innovative in that it was not only the largest barn reputed to be in Pennsylvania, built in Pennsylvania at that time, but he also developed a system for venting the hot air produced by hay. And instead of a cupola, which allows the hot, moist air to rise as soon as a conductor from lightning and electricity, he forewent that and he put vents in under the eaves to uh, diffuse the air. So Frederick is going to be an agricultural innovator, uh, especially with barns, with farms, with the efficient design of both. And you see the home he built, Creekside, which is still in place out on uh, McClure's Gap Road. Uh, many of you are familiar with Frederick's place. There's still a little sign outside that says Creekside by the side of the road. So the house is still there, and it's lived in by a retired professor at Dickinson College. Um, Ashton and his wife Kimberly Nichols own it and take very good care of it. Okay, we saw that, whoops, going backwards, going forwards. Uh, Watts, in the 1820s, also involves himself with Dickinson College. And uh, Dickinson, as you know, is the first college established west of the Susquehanna. And it really had, uh, it enjoyed success pretty early on, coming right out of the gates. Uh, you see two prominent alums of Dickinson here, James Buchanan, you know what happened to him, and Roger Taney. Um, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. So uh, Dickinson, of course, was originally Presbyterian, thoroughly Presbyterian, and then uh, it became German Reformed. It went through a period of about 16 years of great turmoil, tension between faculty and trustees. And uh, uh, it, it's a long story, we won't get too involved with that, but it uh, managed to secure a state appropriation that kept it afloat for a number of years because the student body dwindled to uh, uh, next to nothing. Um, Watts, uh, as a trustee, after he serves as secretary, he helps to engineer a transfer of Dickinson from German Reformed to the Methodist denomination. The Methodists at this time were really uh, getting involved very quickly and heavily in higher education. They relinquished their earlier distrust of book learning and higher education because so many of their young people were going to other denominational colleges in this country. And so uh, Dickinson becomes Methodist and uh, remained as such for many, many years. Um, Watts also, when he is there as a trustee, recommends a new curriculum that doesn't fly because the faculty don't like it. But curriculum that would be a lot, a lot more practical and a lot less classical than was the tradition at that time. So, shortly uh, after that, in the uh, early late 1830s and early 1840s, Watts becomes involved with the Cumberland Valley Railroad, and you're all familiar with that. Uh, he builds it up. He is president from 1841 to 73, that's a long time. And basically, he made it one of the most stable and prosperous uh, lines of its sort in, in America. It was the first branch line acquired by the Pennsylvania Railroad in 1859. So the PRR got a controlling interest in it, but they kept it mainly as a local railroad and they kept Watts on as president during this time. And Watts did a, you know, he had a to my mind, a wondrous record of achievement in the 1840s. Won't go through all of it, but he, uh, he manages to bring the railroad through the panic of 1837, a great depression, uh, nationwide depression that lasted uh, through the Mexican War. Uh, one of the great achievements was this bridge across the Susquehanna River that you see here. Uh, the original bridge caught fire and burned to the ground. 
uh, Watts quickly engineered um, an appropriation from the state and some other means to rebuild the bridge at a cost of about $160,000, and uh, there you see it. Uh, he did a lot of other things too that I won't belabor, but um, he also, through all of this, continues his work as a so-called gentleman farmer. He buys two more farms and he continues to innovate on these farms. Uh, on the left you see his second farm, which adjoins Creekside, and you see the barn design. It, I mean, aesthetically, it's, it's gorgeous. It's a, a, a tri-gable barn. It is no longer there, but the farmhouse beside it still is, somewhat altered, but it's still there along McClure's Gap Road. And then on the right, you see the experimental farm, 116 acres along the, uh, the old Chambersburg Pike uh, that he owned and uh, built out for a 10-year period. You see here the final design. Uh, this is a very efficient uh, barn, a tri-gable barn and a farmhouse. Uh, Watts was very concerned with laying things out for efficiency, whether it's storage, whether it's the way uh, farmers relate to their livestock. Uh, quite an innovator. And he wrote a book, not a, not a book, but a, uh, an influential article uh, that he sent to the Commissioner of Agriculture in 1864 called The Pennsylvania Barn. So Watts did a lot, but his two probably most important contributions also came around 1840. The first was the introduction of so-called Mediterranean wheat to Pennsylvania. Right here, a couple of miles uh, along the Clare's Gap Road at Creekside. Uh, Pennsylvania, as you probably can remember, was long known as the breadbasket of uh, America the granary of the Revolutionary War, a huge wheat-producing state. But one of the problems was the uh, depredations of an insect pest called the, the uh, Hessian fly, which uh, was uh, an invasive insect believed to have been imported by Hessian soldiers uh, somehow through their saddlebags and their livestock um, during the Revolutionary War. And it would uh, annually destroy uh, uh, much, of the, much of the crop. Uh, but Watts was able to obtain, uh, during a visit to a friend uh, in New Jersey, uh, some barrels of seeds from, uh, uh, that were imported from Europe. <coughs> and uh, apparently, these, this, this strain of uh, wheat matured earlier before the hatching season of the Hessian fly. And it was rapidly adopted in this county and throughout uh, Pennsylvania and elsewhere, and it really did a lot to uh, save the day for Pennsylvania farmers. And then, a year later, he introduces the McCormick Reaper to Pennsylvania. Again, uh, out here uh, at Creekside. And apparently what happened was, the story is well told, especially in an article by uh, Jerry Klaus and Kate Kaufman called Watts' Folly, uh, but apparently, Watts bought the machine. Uh, I think he may be the first person in America, not only Pennsylvania, but the first in America to purchase the McCormick Reaper, to actually buy it. And at that time, it was still, it had, been, uh, it, it had received its patent, but uh, it was still terribly experimental. And uh, he brought it up here. He advertised the fact that he was going to show how this worked. And apparently a crowd gathered, uh, 500 to 1,000 local folks, it is said, uh, and they were sort of chortling about the whole thing, uh, naming the experiment Watts' Folly. And they expected it to be pretty much a failure. But apparently what happened was uh, Watts uh, put the machine through its trial, and uh, there was a person walking beside it, raking the wheat uh, off the platform and onto the ground to be bound later, and the person could not keep up with the horse and the reaper. Um, it was tried a second time, some adjustments were made, but the poor fellow still couldn't keep up. And then a well-dressed gentleman came out of the crowd <coughs> and proceeded to get up on the platform and 
as you probably pretty much in the, in the same fashion that you see illustrated here, and easily rake the wheat onto the ground. And that person was none other than Cyrus McCormick, the inventor of the machine. So that's the episode of uh, Watts' Fall. And that brings us to midlife, to Frederick's midlife. Again, born in 1801, he's going to live until uh, 1889, but now he's going to move into a much larger stage, that of the state of Pennsylvania and later on the nation, the American nation. One of the, uh, the great historians of Pennsylvania agriculture, uh, Stevenson Fletcher, says from 1850 until 1880, he was by far the most outstanding figure in Pennsylvania agriculture. Uh, in earlier decades, Watts was pretty much acknowledged as the father of the Pennsylvania State College, but I'm not sure that's quite the appropriate term that's uh, in use anymore. Uh, I think he would be known more as the prime mover because there were a lot of other people who were working with him uh, to push this idea of an agricultural college. Um, but uh, there's no question that Watts was pretty much the indispensable man in this process. So moving along, before all of this, there is an organization in Pennsylvania centered in Philadelphia. It is the Philadelphia Society for, for Promoting Agriculture. And I look at this society as being kind of the grandfather of the Farmers High School, which later becomes Penn State. And you have to look at the Philadelphia Society as being an early scientific organization, peopled by gentlemen farmers, men of means, uh, men of public affairs, physicians, inventors, scientists, uh, politicians. And you can see some of the, uh, the caliber of men who composed this organization, signers of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, and on and on. And the Philadelphia Society, in May of 1850, puts out the call, sounds the alarm, says, we need to get a state agricultural society up and running. Pennsylvania is coming to this endeavor very late in the game. We need to get a state society up and running. It blames farmers for their lethargy, and it blames the legislature for reluctance to provide any kind of funding. And it says, many other states are racing ahead of Pennsylvania in organizing farmers. It says, it, the uh, society says, it's a cause of regret that Pennsylvania, essentially agricultural, cannot yet boast a state institution. So that's the call, and it is answered. It is answered about eight months later. So in January of 1851, uh, the Pennsylvania State Agricultural Society is founded and Frederick Watts is elected president. His goal is to use the state society as his lever, as his lever for elevating the political and social and economic standing of Pennsylvania's farmers. So what Watts does is to uh, employ a two-pronged strategy. The first is to put together annual state fairs annual state exhibitions where farmers can come together, talk to each other, display their wares, their products, look at the machinery, pretty much like the Pennsylvania Farm Show, but in its earliest incarnation, if you will. So that's a big part of it, and part of the State Agricultural Society uh, is going to be composed of county agricultural societies. He wants to see them up and running as well. The second prong is to found an agricultural college based on scientific agriculture. Uh, let me just pause here a second and paint a very brief picture of uh, Pennsylvania and America in the 1850s. Uh, the country and the state was really, despite the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution in Pennsylvania, it's overwhelmingly agricultural. In Pennsylvania, about 85% of the folks living in the Commonwealth are uh, farm folk, they're agricultural, they're rural, and uh, agriculture is the means of sustaining yourself and making a living. So uh, the great concern, aside from insect pestilence, is the, the, uh, the soil exhaustion. And how do we mitigate the soil so that it can continue to produce sufficient food? 
And so scientific agriculture really becomes the rage of the day, and chemistry is the foundation of that. You know, how do we find the right ingredients to uh, promote uh, better soil that produces uh, more crops, and so on and so forth. And under Watts's leadership, the State Agricultural Society becomes an overnight success. You can see these statistics here. Uh, the State Fair, the first one is in 1851, in October of that year, 20,000 people attend. It's a big number. But look, three years later, in Philadelphia, 200,000 people are there. Membership grows, it quadruples from 2,000 to 8,000 by 1854. So in just about three years, four years, Watts has this organization functioning as probably the best such state association of its kind in America, along with New York and Ohio. And the state society moves just as quickly to establish an agricultural college. It's the Farmers High School of Pennsylvania. Uh, the first missive that issues from the state society goes out in January 1853, two years after the state society is founded itself. And uh, basically it is Watts drafting the report, uh, noting that agriculture is now a progressive art and rapidly assuming the form and condition of a science. So, here it is. We're going to try to get this college up and running. Now, it's called the Farmers High School. Why is that? Well, uh, the founders were thinking that the name college conjures up images of uh, the sons of gentlemen who are given to literary pursuits, uh, living in uh, the lap of luxury at these uh, colleges uh, with a disdain for manual labor and hard work. And so the name is chosen to basically mollify farmers, to basically assuage their concerns. <coughs> Manual labor is going to be required of students. And uh, the school, they want the school to be accessible to markets, but not in a large town or city. Why is that? The temptations of the city will be a distraction <laughs> to young men. So we're not going to locate it in a city. So Watts drafts a bill immediately. This is 1853 now. And uh, what happens is it's introduced too late for the legislature to really act on it. So uh, they, they go back, back to the drawing board, and Watts comes out with a new plan. He submits it in a letter to Governor William Bigler, whom you see here. And you can see what the costs are, $38,000 to uh, operationalize the institution and about $16,000 a year to keep it functioning. So, the uh, bill, the new bill, is submitted uh, in 1854. It passes the legislature. It's signed by Governor Bigler. But uh, there are two changes that the legislature makes. First of all, uh, no money, no state appropriation, and too many trustees. The bill specifies 65 trustees. Now you can imagine, you know what roads were like in Pennsylvania today. Imagine what they were like in 1854, trying to get 65 people, one from each county, together in one place at one time. Not going to happen. Okay, so Waltz and the State Agricultural Society call for the legislature to issue a new charter with a state appropriation and uh, also with a much smaller number of trustees, 13. So the new charter passes. They do get 13 trustees, but they still get no state appropriation. But here, what you see here are the 13 original trustees. And this, to me, is the genius of this institution at the time. This was to be a public institution. There are not many public institutions in America at this time. There are about, by 1860, about 220 colleges in this country. Most all of them, most all of them are private, denominational, headed by a minister, and wedded primarily to a classical curriculum, Greek and Latin, literary studies, uh, liberal arts, and so on and so forth. And most of them are local institutions, parochial, if you will. This is designed to be a statewide institution, and so they are drawing trustees from all corners of the state, as you see here. And so 
that to me is a demonstration of the fact that we are to be broadly representative of all of Pennsylvania. So it's 1855, the new charter is signed by Governor Pollock, and the race is on to figure out where to put this place. There's a competition that's developing. And you can see here some of the offers coming in from Center County, Erie County, Blair County, Franklin County, Perry County, Allegheny County, Union County, so on and so forth. And you see some of the men here. You see this guy in the upper right hand corner? That's James Miles. He's one of the original trustees. And uh, it's interesting in that he is the son of William Miles, with whom Watts read law in Erie from 1819 to 1821. So uh, uh, not many degrees of separation there. James Irvin is the Center County Ironmaster who really sweetens the offer. He really wants to get this institution located in remote, and I mean remote, Center County, Pennsylvania. So he offers 200 acres of land. Uh, he'll, he'll offer more if the institution rents it and eventually purchase it, purchases uh, another 200 acres, and he guarantees uh, $10,000 to help build the institution through a fundraising or a subscription campaign. And he says, you know, the Farmers High School would be especially beneficial to the particular district in which it shall be established, and I therefore desire its location in Center County. And you can read the rest of it. Uh, Urban was not a man to be trifled with. He had, uh, he was actually fabulously wealthy. He was a very successful ironmaster. He was the general of a state militia division. He was a two-term congressman, and he had run for governor of Pennsylvania in the late 1840s, uh, but was defeated. But uh, not a man to be trifled with. And so the committee gets together and travels. And the head of this committee is actually the governor of the Commonwealth, uh, Governor James Pollock. Can you imagine the governor of the state getting on a train with a couple of other trustees going out into the hinterlands to try to cite the institution? Well, the first place they visit is uh, Center Furnace. And there you see Center Furnace Mansion. So they, expect the, they inspect the lands, and there's a wonderful banquet that's provided for the folks. And the committee then gets back, uh, goes back to Spruce Creek, jumps the train, travels to Erie, views the site there, goes to Allegheny County, and then back to Blair County. And then and on September 12th, 1855, meeting in Harrisburg, after uh, debating the various sites, and there were motions for other sites besides Center County, but Watts was the person who put the original motion on the table to go to Center County. He thought that was the best place. And eventually, after some debate, they concurred with Watts's original motion and selected uh, Center County. They also elected Watts president of the Board of Trustees. That's a position he's going to hold for the next 19 years. But as soon as the site is selected, it incurs criticism. It's not close to a rail line. It's not close to running water, no stream, no major river close by. They thought the soil was not of sufficient quality. But uh, Watts says, uh, our best effort determined that Center County held the combination of the most essential advantages of soil, service, exposure, healthfulness, and centrality. Now, again, you're in the middle of the state, not much around it, and very hard to get to, very hard to access, but that's part of the genius. They want it in the middle of the state. They don't want it close to Philadelphia, or Harrisburg, or Pittsburgh. They don't want it to be identified with a particular um, major metro area or location. They want it to be a Pennsylvania institution, and therefore they want it smack dab in the middle of the state. So work gets underway. They hire this guy, William Waring, the superintendent of farming grounds. He's a noted horticulturalist. Uh, he wrote a book called the Fruit, Tree, uh, the Fruit Grower's Handbook. He wrote columns on fruit growing for the New York Tribune. They hired a Carlisle construction firm, Turner and Natcher, for $55,000 to construct the college building, uh, now known as Old Main. And uh, the first building to go up, however, it's a farm school, you need a barn. And so here it is. This is the barn designed by no other than 
Frederick Watts, gets the first building to be completed. So 1857, the building moves along. Uh, the west wing of the college is now three stories up. Here you see five stories. So imagine in your mind's eye the top two stories being cut off. That's how high it was. The legislature actually finally comes around and appropriates $25,000 with the promise of $25,000 more if the trustees can raise an equal amount. Well, they can't. And the reason they can't is another panic, another economic depression, the Panic of 1857. It sets in. It's a national depression, and it cripples the Pennsylvania iron industry. So, 1858, construction stops. Turner and, Nat and Natcher are basically going broke. Uh, they're nearly bankrupt. They quit work in the middle of July. Uh, they had severely underestimated the cost of building this facility. Watts hires a new contractor to complete the West Wing. Uh, the new governor of Pennsylvania, uh, William Packer, uh, is very supportive of the institution and uh, things near completion. Uh, Watts says, our school is founded on a scale that will afford complete instruction equal to that of our leading colleges. And I love this quote. For should not the education of farmer's sons be superior to, rather than less than equal to, that of any other class? And so, finally, the building is up and uh, ready for instruction and operation. Watts says a new light is about to break on the agricultural community. And so, in February of 1859, you have 69 students on site, four faculty, no president, and a building one-third complete. The building you see here is only one-third of the intended structure. But with lofty ambition and well-defined purpose, the Farmers High School of Pennsylvania opens its doors, its doors and gets to work. Now, if you look at the uh, young man, the student, in the middle, in front of the mule, that is Frederick Watts III. This is Frederick Watts' son, known as Fred. So he's a member, he's going to get his degree in 1862. I thought that was a kind of interesting shot. So Frederick Watts is putting his money where his mouth is. He's sending his son to an experimental scientific institution. And Watts manages to do the best possible thing in the world. He hires a brilliant founding president, this gentleman, Evan Pugh, age 31, Chester County native. Uh, he spent the last six years in Europe training as a scientist. Uh, he basically conducts a very famous nitrogen fixation experiment that basically settles the question of how plants assimilate nitrogen through the air or through the soil. Pew's work shows that definitively they assimilate nitrogen through the soil. And it gets him elected as a fellow of the London Chemical Society. So Pew comes here. He arrives in October of 1859, and his plan, his vision, as articulated here, these are his words, he wants to develop upon the soil of Pennsylvania the best agricultural college in the world for the ag student of America. And remarkably, he does this in four and a half years. You know, Joe Paterno had what he called his great experiment at Penn State, and most of you know what that's about, mm -hmm. uh, his grand experiment. Evan Pugh had his what he called his great experiment. And what he did was to build the nation's first successful agricultural college, again with guidance from Frederick Watts. Uh, on the highest scientific standards of the day, he secured the federal and state land grant designation for the college. That's a big deal. That's huge. But he was also a national figure, and he influenced the development of agricultural colleges, research stations, federal agencies, and policies on the national side to advance agriculture. And he wrote the first visionary plan for American land-grant colleges. A brilliant man. The people who are really making this place work are, is this a trio, this triumvirate of Frederick Watts as chairman of the board, uh, Evan Pugh as president of the, of the college, and the local trustee from Belfont, Hugh McAllister, who was a native of Juniata County. <coughs> And you can see here, um, McAllister was kind of a local trustee. He lived on a farm right outside of Elfont. 
11 miles from campus, and he could get in when he needed to. And uh, as the original historian of the institution said, there was scarcely a day which did not have some task for the college which demanded his thought and counsel. So the three of them are running the place. Evan Pugh, back to him. He graduates the first class of Bachelor of Scientific Agriculture degrees in America in 1861. And there you see them. And uh, look at the name, the word scientific, agriculture. That's essential. That's Pew's designation. He secures a second state appropriation of almost $50,000 to complete the college building. And you can see what it looks like, finally, when it opens in very, when it's completed in very early 1864. Pew builds enrollment from 88 in 1861 to 146 in 1864. This is the largest enrollment of any agricultural college in America. And uh, uh, far and away it was the best, no question about that. And consider, he's doing this in the midst of the greatest crisis in American history, the Civil War. I mean, men and money are going to war, but he's building enrollments, he's building this place out. And probably most important, he secures the land grant designation for the college. And uh, he's later going to fight legislative attempts to actually remove or rescind the land grant designation and award it to other institutions. The Land Grant Act, the Moral Land Grant Act, what is it? Well, the theory is this, federal land. America is rich, millions and millions and millions of acres of land, federal land. The idea is that you provide an apportionment of land to each state based on its population. The idea is that the land is to be sold and the proceeds used to establish an endowment, basically to establish the institution uh, that will become land-grant colleges across the country. And you see the language of the act. So you're not going to exclude scientific studies, you're not going to include, exclude the liberal arts, you're going to include military tactics, it's the Civil War, and the Union needs officers. But you're going to focus on agriculture and the mechanic arts. That's agriculture and engineering in order to promote the liberal and practical education of the industrial classes. This is new. This is new in America. Who are the industrial classes? Well, it's about 80% of the population, four out of five American adults. It's those people who work with their hands to make a living. So farmers, engineers, mechanics, laborers, shopkeepers, you name it. These are the industrial classes. But hard stop to all of this. In April 1864, Evan Pugh's been in place about four and a half years. He dies, 36 years old, shockingly. Typhoid fever takes him out. And you can see what the American Journal of Science and Arts says about him in its obituary. The Agricultural College of Pennsylvania, the first institution of its kind, and attaining a high degree of success and usefulness as a result of the rare combination of scientific and practical knowledge with administrative energy which characterized its lamented president. His death is a loss to Pennsylvania and the nation. So what do you do? What does Frederick Watts do? Well, he and McAllister had the great good sense to approach Pugh's best friend and confidant, the guy at the upper left, Samuel Johnson, who is an agri a young agricultural scientist and who is going to become known as the doyen of American agricultural science, science, the best agricultural scientist in the country. He's at Yale, and he thinks about it, but he declines. He says, I just don't have the, the energy uh, to do this. Uh, I think he knows what a crushing load it would have been from his relationship and his letter writing to Evan Pugh. So Watts approaches the only other person he knows, this gentleman named William Allen on the right. And who is he? He's the recently retired president of Girard College in Philadelphia, a wealthy and experimental institution. But he's a former faculty member, and uh, he was acting president of a year for a year at, right here at Dickinson College. But uh, Allen is classically trained and oriented. He's not a scientist. And already there is dissension 
This gentleman here, George W. Caldwell, this young guy here, another brilliant chemist, uh, German educated, close friend and confidant of Evan Pugh. And Caldwell is on faculty replacing Evan Pugh, and he says, you know, this isn't right. He says, a scientific man should be placed at the head of the institution, and you know as well as I how strong Dr. Pugh would have insisted upon this. So already a little bit of dissension. William Allen is going to be in State College at Penn State at the Farmers High School for only two years. Finances are a problem. There is a bill that passes the legislature to basically <coughs> assign only one third of the land grant proceeds to the Agricultural College and to place the other two thirds in the state treasury to park the funds there until the legislature could figure out what to do with them. So, faculty rebellion is brewing against uh, William Allen. There's a plan of reorganization that is passed, but there's a cultural mismatch. Uh, Allen and his wife, his wife was uh, Honora Curtin from Belfont. And interestingly enough, she is the sister of Andrew Curtin, who is going to be Pennsylvania's great Civil War governor. But apparently, uh, the couple, used to the good life in Philadelphia, uh, really had a hard time of it in very primitive state college, Pennsylvania. <laughs> so they regretted that they had moved there, and they were happy to move back to Philadelphia. And uh, Alan went back to Gerard College as president and served there for a number of years until his death. OK. So what do you do? Let me see here. So Watts is trying to figure out, after this bill is passed in the legislature, he's trying to figure out how to get the entire land grant fund designated to the Agricultural College. And he says, uh, you know, if you give us the, this grant, we'll establish two other experimental farms, one in western Pennsylvania and one in eastern Pennsylvania, in addition to the one at the college. He asked the legislature to approve a bond issue uh, and the legislature does so, but it denies the entire land grant fund. So what do you do? Well, there's a new president on board, a guy named John Fraser, and he's on faculty already as a professor of mathematics and astronomy. And uh, he's appointed president after, after Allen. He has a grand plan. He's very ambitious. He wants to grow the faculty from 8 to 23, you know, tripling the faculty. Um, and he also wants to put in place a number of engineering courses and practicums. He, of the presidents between Evan Pugh and the second founder, George Atherton, best understands what the Moral Act is all about. And Watts, again, is uh, trying to figure out how do we get the entire land grant fund? And so what he construes is what I call a Hail Mary Pass. So he authorizes a new petition to the legislature. He says, if you give us all the income from the sale of moral land funds, you either do that or you guys, the state of Pennsylvania, the legislature, the commonwealth, takes over the institution, you take on our debts, you run our place. You either give us the money we need to succeed or you take, you take over. And uh, it worked. It worked. The Hail Mary Pass worked. And shortly thereafter, in February of 1867, uh, the bill, HB 215, is passed, and all land grant proceeds are devoted exclusively to the college, finally, in return for the establishment of three experimental farms, East, Central, and West. The Morrill Act said that although no funds could be expended for buildings and grounds, you could use one-tenth of your uh, proceeds to establish experimental farms. And so now the log jam of sales breaks up. The 780,000 acres that were allotted to Pennsylvania, the second most populous state in the Union, generates about $440,000, 56 cents per acre. That's not so good. I mean, the federal benchmark for an acre of land at this time is $1.25. Meanwhile, the Fraser presidency is unraveling. Enrollment is dropping. Uh, despite this expanded curriculum, there are only 30 undergraduate students in residence 
in the fall of 1868. Uh, this dooms the plan for expanding the faculty because that was predicated on a growth in enrollment. That's where the money was going to come from. And the reduced emphasis on agricultural science is beginning to draw criticism from the agricultural community. And so Fraser resigns. He's out of there. So it's 1868, four years after Pew. Watson, the trustees, re retrench. The college is teetering very precariously. The plan of reorganization has failed. The new burden of establishing experimental farms had costs, although there's money to buy the farms. You know, you have to maintain them year to year, and that costs money. So the faculty is reduced by half, and the Aggies are really starting to get uh, up in arms. One says, I have been pained to learn that the college is not prospering. Governor Geary told me that there were not 30 students there this session, which further convinced me that the death of our worthy friend and the late talented Dr. Pugh was a public calamity. Who's up next? Thomas Burroughs, 63 years old, but an educator of impeccable credentials. I mean, look at this. The former superintendent of the common schools in Pennsylvania, the creator of the uh, Normal School Act, this is the act that established, established teachers colleges across Pennsylvania, and the editor of the Pennsylvania School Journal, a renowned educator. But his plan is to make agricultural practice more prominent and uh, really uh, dial back the emphasis on agricultural science. Basically, looking at the place as becoming a finishing school for farmers. Nothing in engineering. Manual labor is reinstated. And the Yankees are up in arms. You have no idea of the almost universal prejudice against the college among the farmers of eastern Pennsylvania, says J. Lacey Darlington. The appointment of Mr. Burroughs has furnished them with another occasion for attack, predicting that this administration will be a failure as the college is practically dead, past resurrection. So Burroughs does a couple of good things. He introduces harvest home festivals, homecoming, farm shows, to publicize the institution. Enrollment does increase a bit, up to 75 in 1871. Now that's half of Pew's 146. Uh, I'm proud to say the Alumni Association was founded <coughs> in 1870. But in late 1870, he takes his students on a mountain camping trip up to Bear Meadows, overtaken by snow. This gentleman gets sick, contracts pneumonia, and dies in February of 1871. The college is teetering even more so. Three troubled presidencies in seven years. Three failed curricular experiments. The experimental farms are struggling and incurring increased criticism. The college is mired in debt. Needed enrollments, they're just not materializing. College is really off track as a developing land-grant institution. Now, keep in mind, it's a land grant institution. It is the recipient of moral funds. You saw the language of the legislation. Agriculture and the mechanic arts engineering are to be the leading object. Okay? This is law. This is a federal mandate. You don't ignore this, but it's being ignored. And Frederick Watts, at least in my view, has to bear some major responsibility because he pushed so hard for Burroughs uh, and supported his new curriculum of practical rather than scientific agriculture. So uh, it's not only that blame needs to be placed on the presidents that were appointed. You have to look at why they were appointed and who was appointing them. And so Frederick Watts bears some of that uh, responsibility. So who's up next? A minister. Now keep in mind, many colleges in America, most of the denominational liberal arts colleges, are headed by ministers. But this is a scientific institution. And it's drifted far from its land-grant imperative. But uh, Watts hires James Calder. He's a native Pennsylvanian. He's a, brought up in Harrisburg. And he's president of Hillsdale College out in Michigan. So he says, uh, we're going to do it with three curriculum. We'll have agriculture, science, and classical. But he's going to make the classical curriculum, Greek, Latin. He's going to bring back the, the dead languages, if you will, and really put an emphasis on liberal education at the expense of science and agriculture. And engineering, it's a non-starter. It's just not going to happen. 
a faculty member, the class of 61, C. Alfred Smith comes back as professor of chemistry in 1877, and he says, I realized how completely the institution had become a mere literary college. But he did have some early ach uh, achievements. There's this curriculum reshuffle, although not for the better. But women, for the first time, are admitted by a trustee resolution in 1871. And in 1872, the land grant endowment increased was increased by the legislature from the $439,000 to $500,000. So that produces about $30,000 a year in income. Now, we are jumping ahead. This is still the Calder administration, but it's 1873. And the old guard of leadership, what's left of them, is really beginning to fade from the scene. Frederick Watts is going to be appointed as Commissioner of Agriculture by President Grant in 1871. He's going to leave for Washington, D.C. with his wife, Henrietta, and uh, he's still going to remain as trustee president for the next three years, but he's going to be hard-pressed to pay much attention to the institution, and he's going to be very hard-pressed to come back for meetings on the Board of Trustees. So McAllister is kind of serving as the de facto trustee president in Watts' absence. But McAllister dies in May of 1873. And so uh, when Watts resigns, finally in 1874, General James Beaver is elected trustee president. And Beaver is going to stay on the board in one capacity or another until his death in 1913. Okay. So here's the descent into the abyss under Calder. He changes the name of the institution to the Pennsylvania State College. He eliminates tuition. Bad move. But he increases spending. Undergraduate enrollments decline, with the preparatory enrollments increasing and eclipsing the undergraduate enrollments. What were preparatory enrollments? Well, most colleges in the 19th century grew their own college students. They had preparatory academies, uh, which uh, youngsters common school on up could attend in hopes that they would then enroll in the collegiate ranks. Well, at Penn State, what's happening is that uh, the college ranks are beginning to decline, but, and the prep ranks are increasing. And you would think that the increase in the prep ranks would beget an increase in the collegiate ranks, but that doesn't happen. Meanwhile, engineering is ignored. Nothing happens there. Agriculture is downplayed. And Pennsylvania is, Penn State is devolving into what I call a backwoods classical college. Meanwhile, outside pressure mounts. The Aggies everywhere are up in arms. The State Grange recommends assuming supervisory control over the college. The Pennsylvania State Agricultural Society, again, this is the organization Watts founded demands the college strengthen its ag curriculum and reorganize its experimental farms into research stations. Uh, the trustees in Calder do prevail on the legislature to make a special appropriation of $80,000 to erase debt, and uh, that is forthcoming, but in return, the pound of flesh that the legislature demands is a cut in faculty salaries of 10%. You can imagine how that went over. And then finally, the state legislature decides to uh, get involved and investigate. And so a committee comes up to the institution, looks at it, talks to people, and says, concludes, while evidence does not show actual fraud or disclose corrupt management, the institution has been very badly managed. So here's the near-death experience and the rebirth. So uh, Calder resigns in January 1880. Uh, he's, he's finished. His successor, Joseph Shortledge, is even worse. He's there for 10 months. He's an absolute uh, disaster. He was the headmaster of an academy in Chester County, and he didn't last long. One faculty member says, tells James Beaver, the president of the Board of Trustees, after 22 years of experimenting, we are today the laughing stock of the state. So there's a faculty committee led by this guy. This is I. Thornton Osmond. This is the guy who 50 years later 
is going to present that paper that I showed you at the beginning. This is him. He is the head of a faculty committee that the trustees put together to look at the curriculum and revise it. And so he says in 1881, the college had nothing whatever in mechanic arts or engineering. The main focus was the classical course uh, and also a, you know, a, a token scientific course, just what the usual small colleges had at the time. In 1881 came a new, 82 came a new era to general courses, scientific and classical, and four technical courses. And here's where the rubber meets the road. Agriculture, natural history, chemistry and physics, and civil engineering. And he concludes that the college has been distinctly differentiated from the other colleges of the state and correlated with the land grant act of <coughs> Congress of 1862. The legislature comes back a couple of years later, two years later, and concludes, the state college is in good faith fulfilling the trusts committed to it by the state. We believe it has passed its, worth, its worst days. Whew. Well, it's not just what's happening with Penn State at the time. The 1870s, without belaboring things, were a very tough time for land-grant colleges nationally. There was a lot of jealousy in this country about these colleges. Uh, they were new, they were experimental, they were scientific, they were aimed at a new class of people that had been underserved, the industrial classes. And here they are getting this federal money. There's a lot of jealousy. The presidents of private colleges and the two most prestigious institutions in the country, Harvard and, well, Princeton, um, are criticizing the Land-Grant College Act and saying, you know, if federal dollars are going to be forthcoming, they ought to go to the strongest colleges in the country, not the weakest. Congress launches an investigation in 1874, but it winds up absolving the colleges. The National Grange, this is an organization that has caught fire. The panic, here's another panic, this is the panic of 1873, and it is a huge national depression, and it devastates American agriculture. And farmers are losing farms, they are up in arms, the National Grange explodes in membership, and it actually becomes an adversarial organization to the land-grant colleges. And it says, you know, we farmers ought to control these colleges exclusively. So there's a new advocate for land-grant colleges, the gentleman you see here, George Atherton of Rutgers. Uh, he makes speeches, he organizes land-grant college presidents, and he defends them through the 1870s. He's hired as Penn State's seventh president in 1882, and over the course of his presidency into the early 1900s, he stabilizes the institution, he grows it, he strengthens engineering in particular, and agriculture, and he builds it up for success in the 20th century. What about Watts? Well, Watts now, 1871, he's still president of the Board of Trustees at Penn State, but he's uh, also Commissioner of Agriculture for the United States. He's the third Commissioner of Agriculture. And this position is eventually going to be made Secretary of Agriculture and will become cabinet level, but that's in the future. That's in the late 1880s that that takes place. So Watts, as a Commissioner of Agriculture, with a lot of responsibility, very little money from Congress, and uh, his appointment actually is, is, uh, is somewhat criticized by the agricultural community. Why? because he's a lawyer, and he's a railroad company president. And a lot of farmers don't have a lot of love for lawyers and for the railroads, because of the you know, perception that railroads are charging an arm and a leg to transport their, their produce to market. But Watts calls uh, right out of the gates for a national convention in 1872. All the land grant colleges and the state agricultural societies, and they come to uh, to Washington, and what's, what, what Watts, Watts wants to do is to basically control the research agenda of the land-grant colleges across the country. They're saying, no way is this going to happen. We're going to be responsible for our own research agendas. So that's rebuffed. So Watts makes a good effort to uh, do what he can to bring them under the control of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, but they resist, and so the story ends there for the time being. It's a defeat for Watts. But he goes on to do a number of other things as Commissioner of Agriculture. Um, he greatly expands the seed distribution program 
Now that may not sound like much, but that's one of the two primary founding principles of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which was established in 1862. And he's interested basically in aiding the recovering South, devastated by the Civil War, and the growing West. And uh, he tries to help the devastated South by trying to introduce new plants, new crops, to get them out of that reliance on cotton and tobacco, which is hugely soil depleting. Doesn't work. But he does inaugurate a new division, microscopy. Now you're bringing microscopes in, and now you're starting to look at plant diseases at the cellular level. Very important, and they make some incredible breakthroughs early on in the diagnosis of plant diseases. Watts also lays the foundation for the beginning of the U.S. Forestry Service and hires who will become uh, Franklin Howe, who will become the first U.S. forester. He responds to the 1874 plague of locusts that devastates the Midwest and North Carolina <coughs> states. He pushes massive seed supplies out to them so that they can recover in the year afterwards. And one farmer out there writes, the seed is most acceptable for it relieves me from a state of hopelessness, but it cannot do me half as much good as it does to know that we have a government that cares for her distressed people. And then finally, Watts' triumph is to showcase American agricultural progress at the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, at the 1876 Centennial Exhibition. This is America's first World Fair. World's Fair. This is America's coming out party to the rest of the world, showcasing its industrial prowess and progress, and its agricultural progress as well. And America still is largely agricultural at this time. And uh, you can see um, basically an outline of uh, what the exhibition looked like in Philadelphia's Fairmount Park. There's Horticultural Hall uh, at the top. And Watts is just uh, pleased beyond words. He's able to say, this department has contributed largely to that exposition. Statistics, chemistry, botany, microscopy, and the C division are all there to represent the prodigious progress which has been made in this country in the last 100 years. So that's a triumphant note to go out on. Grant is out of office in 1877. Watts also leaves and returns to Carlisle. Retires to Creekside. He's praised as Cumberland County's most eminent citizen of the 19th century. He is remembered to this day, large intellect, sterling integrity, and unblemished honor. Now keep in mind, if you recall the Grant administration, there was a lot of, a lot of corruption uh, in the Grant administration, but not a hint of scandal touched the U.S. Department of Agriculture in, during Grant's tenure as President of the United States. And that's due to Watts. He was very frugal, extremely honest, unblemished honor, and sterling integrity. And so he dies, August 17, 1889. One of his uh, daughters said, his mind was clear, his faculties good. He was simply worn out and went quietly to sleep without an illness. His legacy, great legal career, brilliant lawyer, Supreme Court reporter for many years, rescued Dickinson College with colleagues, built the Cumberland Valley Railroad into great success. I mean, this was a mover and a shaker par excellence. As an agriculturalist, barn and farm innovator, introduced Mediterranean wheat and the McCormick Reaper to Pennsylvania. Founding president of the Pennsylvania State Agricultural Society, again, his lever for raising the economic, social, and political standing of the Pennsylvania farmer, founding president of the Farmers High School, board of trustees, and the prime mover in organizing, chartering, and building the school, with Evan Pugh making it the first successful agricultural college in America. And he led efforts to defend against legislative attempts to remove the land grant designation from Penn State. As you can see here, he uh, managed that Hail Mary pass, that quid pro quo that said if you give us the entirety of the land grant fund, we will establish experimental farms. The only blot on his legacy, to my mind, is the rush to fill these presidential vacancies with men unsuited 
to a new scientific institution while consenting to their wildly divergent curricular plans. And as a result, the institution was brought to the brink of closure, circa 1880. But as U.S. Commissioner of Agriculture, he expanded the seed distribution program liberally and made key contributions to its development as a scientific agency. And that is the end. That is uh, roughly the story. So thank you. <laughs>